This year for King's Kids, I'm going to start out um, with a Bible verse from Proverbs 22, 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is, you know, something that, you know, we might not go over this verse in King's Kids, but uh, that's kind of what we're trying to do with your children as leaders. Um, we've had a good year with King's Kids so far. We've had a big crowd just about every week. Um, we've probably been averaging about 28 to 30 kids every week. So the uh, Lord's really blessed us with that. Um, last fall, when everything was still shut down, we weren't sure what King's Kid was going to lo look like or if it was even going to be, a, we were even going to be able to do it. Um, and the Lord made a way as usual, and we were able to start back up on September 30th last year. And when we did start up, Angie and I got talking about it, and the, that first night we weren't sure if we were going to have three kids or 33. Well, the first night we had 21 kids and, you know, was overwhelmed with what the Lord had done. So, um, but since we didn't know how many kids we were going to have, normally we break up. We have kindergarten through second grade or first grade. Then we have second and third graders and then fourth through sixth grade classes. Um, that first night we decided that we'd just keep everybody together and just do one lesson for everybody. And we decided to do a lesson on Daniel and the lion's den. And we focused on trusting God and being faithful. Um, we learned that Daniel had been, he had been serving the Lord and been faithful for a really long time. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of what we've been trying to focus on and do throughout the King's Kids this year. Um, we've had a lot of fun with the kids this year and, and really enjoyed teaching them. Um, tonight we've got a uh, few songs prepared and a little video um, kind of show you guys some of the progress they've made and you know we're really proud of all of them and uh, like I said we've been averaging about 28 or 30 kids a week so you know the Lord's really blessed us being able to help out in this in this uh, ministry you know as well as our church so um, we'll start with some of the songs we have Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, 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 and you'll grow, 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 and you'll grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow. Well, they never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never sue on the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir! I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir! I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir! I may never march in the Ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never zoom on the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. But this time, um, there's just a few kids we want to recognize. But before I get to that, um, I just want to, I just want to thank our leaders. Um, when we, when Jason called us and said, "Hey, we're ready to start back King's Kids," we weren't again sure what that was going to look like. Um, we weren't sure what the leadership was going to look like. So there were a lot of, of question marks, but we showed up that first night. And I'm telling you, when I say God just put it all into place, he just put it all into place. He brought the best people. Um, so these three ladies, Travis, Ashley, and Matt Tabscott also, he's not here, but um, they have just done a tremendous job with your kids this year. Um, they have in the great times and in the trying times they have shown the love of god to these kids and we have seen it week after week um, they have been so patient they have presented the word of god to these kids in a way that the kids can understand it and i just want to say from jacob and i we are very thankful for you guys and we really appreciate everything y'all have done this year so <clears throat> So next I want to move to a couple of kids. So each week we kind of keep up with 
um, some attendance. We keep up with who brings a friend. We keep up with who brings their Bibles. By the way, that's really important for them to bring their Bibles to church. So we have a handful of kids. They're very faithful. They carry their Bibles in, and I'm so proud of them. But there's a few kids I want to recognize just for just their faithfulness. So these kids, oh, bless her. <laughs> so these kids have been faithful. They're here. They've only missed a day or two the whole time. Um, they have participated. They have asked questions. Um, and they have just really added a lot to our King's Kids program. So I'm going to call your name, and I want you just to stand up. You don't have to come up here, but we have a little certificate for them, and it's for the Faithful Attendance Award. And that we've got like six of them. So I've got Evan Parker, EJ Parker, <laughs> Chloe Parker, Noah Parker, Layla Parker, Mason Parker, Malachi, and Jude Fouts. So thank you guys for all your, all your participation this year and just for being faithful and being here and just being awesome kids. Thank you. Our Father, who has art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the itty bitty babies. In his hands, he's got the itty bitty babies. In his hands, he's got the whole itty bitty babies. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the wind and the rain. In his hands, he's got the wind and the rain. In his hands, he's got the wind and the rain. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Um, some special kids to recognize. So every year, we have a handful of kids that are moving up from the children's ministry to the youth ministry. And this is always a little bit of a bittersweet time because we've been doing King's Kids for a few years now. So a lot of these kids, we've had them since we started. And so I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to get all emotional. But it is a little sad when you see them move up because um, you do form bonds with these kids. So these kids, I want them to come down here. Um, so for the girls, um, I want Sarah, McKinley, and Jenny to come down here. And I want to say something about each of these girls. These, these are some really special girls to me and in different ways. So Sarah has this natural leadership. I don't know if you guys know her, but she is just a solid kid, right? So she is, she's actually like another teacher in the class. Like she's just, she's just a smart kid. She's a, a, just a natural leader. So she's going to do great in the youth group. Um, McKinley is maybe the sweetest child I've ever met in my life. So she just brings a real kindness and a real calm to the group. Um, she, on nights where I'm feeling a little wild and crazy, McKinley just kind of chills everything out. She's like, it's okay, it's all right. But she, she really is a sweet kid. And Jenny, Jenny's a tough cookie. I don't know if y'all know Jenny, but Jenny and I have bonded, and I love her. And I love her honesty, and I love her just she is who she is and I love that and so all of these kids are just really special to me so I want I, we did get them all a Bible but there's a shipping delay so they will be here so we will get them to get the Bibles to them um, but I love you girls and you girls are going to do great in the youth group so you're in
And I only had one boy moving up, that's CK. So CK, uh, I spoke with his parents last year because I thought he was supposed to move up last year. And uh, we was, he goes to a different school, so he takes some older classes. And, uh, but I think he's a little younger, so he kind of fell in a tricky situation. So luckily I was able to keep him with us again, and he's really smart. And uh, I like having CK around. We talk baseball. We talk about a few other things, and uh, but he's really a good kid. He helps keep some of the other ones, some of the younger kids in line with me. But uh, I appreciate having you, and you're going to do good in the youth group as well. So. I missed out on heartaches this world feels every day. And I missed out on a broken home that would steal my joy away. I missed out on all the things they said I'd miss out on Or was somehow I have a heart of peace When their good times are gone Cause I've, I've been sheltered by His grace Kept in a safe place Protected by the prayers of those That's brought me safe this far Was safe to lead me home For the truth that they've instilled in me Will last when they are gone Cause I've been sheltered by His grace Kept in a safe place Protected by the prayers of those who sheltered by his grace and you don't make things right you are just as guilty as the man who kills so in other words that is the beginning of that sin when we begin to yield to it that's where it is so it humbles me it, it really humbled me to be able to evaluate my own life and be able to realize that even though we do have it together on the outside and we're not sitting behind bars somewhere when we stand before God listen this is very humbling and very convicting when we stand before God one day listen friend we're going to give an account and it's not just going to be what's seen on the news and what the judge says and as he strikes uh, the hammer down if you want to say it that way no it's going to be what God sees in our hearts so may we live right every single day of our life last week we begin to dive and if you'll stay with me it's gonna be a lot of Bible tonight we begin to dive a little bit further and uh, as we did we came to the portion of scripture of Matthew 5 verse number 27 let me read these few verses tonight and we're going to go a little bit further the Bible says in verse 27 ye have heard that it was said of them old time thou shalt not commit adultery so tonight the question is not are you guilty of murder the question tonight just like last week and we'll go further is are we guilty of adultery it's a hard question and it's even harder to answer when you begin to see how God breaks this down he says in verse number 28 he says but I say unto you 
that whosoever looketh on a woman and lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. We have learned there's a transition that's here. In other words, he says, ye have heard. In other words, all you know is what you know. He says, but I say unto you, he said, I'm going to make it plain. If you really want to know the truth, it's not just on what you see in the law. You submit to me and you follow me because it's going to go a little bit deeper. So just because you look good on the outward appearance does not mean that you're good on the inside. So he, he dives deeper into this. And then notice what the Bible says in verse 29. He says, and if thou write, I offend thee, he said, pluck it out and cast it from thee. And it is profitable for thee that not one of thy members should perish and not one uh, and not thy whole body should come, uh, should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. So we come to this place to where he is now concluding the thought of adultery. So I want to stop here and I want to just elaborate for a minute. I want to go back and be able to tell you that there was a common explanation that we said. And what was it? It was simply this, is that the Pharisees, the scribes, literally said that if you commit adultery right? That means that you are having the physical act to be caught, to be able to have the physical act with somebody else that is not your spouse. Now, I want to say this. That is exactly what adultery is. There's no doubt about it. Remember, Jesus did not come to extinguish the law. He did not come to contradict the law, but rather what he did is come to fulfill the law. So what he said is this, is yes, you are correct. If you commit the act with somebody else outside of your spouse, you are committing adultery however that is the common explanation he says but now verse number notice this verse number 28 I say unto you in other words I'm just going to make it plain I'm going to give you the correct exposition if I can say it that way I'm going to give you the correct exposition in other words I'm going to tell you what what it really means and he goes on down and he says that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her uh, hath uh, committed adultery with her already in his heart so what the Lord says is I'm not just interested in the outward appearance he said I'm interested also on the inside he says if you so much look at her it's not just about the act it's also about the attitude so whether or not it's a physical action, whether or not it's something that you and I uh, perceive that we look on, something that we're looking out the window, whether we're sitting on the beach and, and lusting after somebody, whether we're watching a movie, whether you're on a late night TV screen, whether you're on a computer, on your own cell phone, and this is not just for man, this is also for woman. He says, if you've done that and you've thought about that in your mind, you already, when you and I stand before God, if we chose to do that, we have committed adultery. I said this last week and I say it again, I say it every week because the more that I study the Bible, the more that I realize I'm not as close to the Lord as I want to be. Uh, the more that I realize how holy he is, the more I realize how unholy I am. And we got to stop and be able to say, you know what, I, I need to have a little bit of mercy and grace. Never condoning somebody else's sin, but when the Lord begins to break it down, break it down, break it down, you begin to have to ask yourself the question, am I guilty of this? And friend, if you don't, listen, I got a question question whether or not you're saved because if you love the Lord you want to be able to please the Lord if you love the Lord you want to be able to honor your husband and your wife if you love the Lord you want to be able to have a marriage that symb is symbolic of Christ in the church so it should matter to you so the Lord begins to dive in to the heart there were some verses that I shared because the Lord begins to talk about lust he says to lust, to lust. So the, the problem is not just the act. The problem is also the attitude of lust. Lust is never satisfied. Are you hearing me? Lust is never satisfied. I shared this verse last week. He says the horse leech had two daughters crying, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things say not. It is enough. The grave that are barren wound, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire saith not. It is enough. In other words, the the lust that is in our life it's like a horse leech it just keeps sucking and sucking and sucking and sucking and if you and I do not eliminate what causes us to lust 
it will continue to suck out of your life and it will ruin your life and your marriage. And the Lord Jesus is saying, I don't just want you to have a marriage. I want you to have a happy marriage. I want you to have a healthy marriage. I want you to have a marriage that really does symbolize Christ in the church. So he's saying you must deal with this issue of lust. Why? Because he breaks it down and he goes further. And I was giving some more scripture last week. First Samuel chapter number 16, verse number seven. He says, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance for the height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as, uh, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So God reminds us in his word, friend, you can have every T crossed and every I dotted on the outside, but if you and I are not right on the inside, we are as guilty as the one that is caught in the very act. The Bible tells us that we ought to be able to keep ourselves pure. That's our responsibility. That is what we are supposed to do. And then it comes down. I go a little bit further. Last week we came not only to the common explanation that many of us know, not only to the Lord uh, himself having a correct exposition, but then we came down to the compelling execution. Notice what the Bible says there in verse number 28 in the latter part of it. He says this. He said, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon the woman and lust after her in his, uh, 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 lust after her committed adultery with her already in his, uh, in his heart. Verse number 29. And if, so now all of a sudden he, he's changing things and he's saying, now wait a minute, I, I, I want to be able to tell you how to deal with this. If you have this problem, I want to tell you how to deal with this. I brought up the way that we need to reevaluate. You notice the word in verse number 29 and verse number 30, if, if, if. So in other words, I said, if I'm struggling. In other words, there's a question, am I really struggling? We have to ask ourselves, or you know, Brother Jason, are you struggling? Or, or Brother Jason, if you start to struggle, will you call me? If the doctor talks to you, he says, if you start to feel sick, call me. Isn't that what the doctor says? That's what the Lord's saying. In other words, evaluate yourself evaluate yourself. Don't wait for somebody else to call you out. Don't wait for your, your spouse to call you out. Don't wait for somebody else to be able to call you out and, and say something. He said, no, if, in other words, you and I personally, we need to examine our own life and say, wait a minute, I don't need somebody else to look at this. I'm going to look at it for myself. But when we begin to reevaluate and we do look, he says, this is the way you deal with your lust. You ready? Remove it. There is if and no if ands or buts about it. You absolutely remove it. The Bible says in verse number 29, what do you do? He said, if the right eye offend thee, notice these words, pluck it out. In other words, whatever it is that leads you to lust, pluck it it out. Get rid of it completely. Make it cease, extinguish, die. Whatever it is that's in your life. And I said this last week and I kind of elaborated a little bit. But friend, it's not just about you and your marriage. It's about you and your significant other. You and your spouse. And if your husband or your wife is not happy with something or somebody, that don't mean that you're rude to people by any means. But friend, you and I ought to love our wife or husband so much forsaking all others, right? Forsaking all others that if that's what gives them peace and security in that marriage then we should let anything die pluck it out whatever it is get it out of my life why because Jesus says red flag red flag red flag do not tolerate this in your life let me ask you a question how many times has marriage has been ruined by different things, very simple things? Or you talk to somebody and divorce would come up or maybe uh, some kind of adultery would come up and it all started with a small conversation. It started with a, a, a lunch coffee. It started with a, a breakfast coffee. It started with a simple email with a text message. It started with something on the backside of Facebook and Messenger. It's all very simple. And the reason why it begins to grow so much is because what happens is it starts off with that lust. And you remember what I said in Proverbs 30, you never get enough. And the problem is, is eventually your sin will find you out and it brings forth and it ruins the marriage. It ruins the home. It ruins a lot of things. And sometimes though he is still King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the people that have looked at our life and seen Jesus, it might get them to doubt the Lord Jesus because the way that we have failed now. So it's bigger than just us. It's bigger than just us. So the Lord says that you must remove these things. I talked about the difference in love and lust. Listen, we need to know the difference. 
We need to know the difference. Love is not like the world loves. There's sometimes when I do weddings and do different things, and I talk about love is not just a, uh, an emotion. It's not just a, a feeling. It's not like I love chocolate cake, that I, I, I love a certain car. Why? Because after about five years, you get tired of the same car. You don't love that car. You just like the idea of it for a while. You don't love chocolate cake because after you eat so much chocolate cake, eventually you're going to get tired of it. And I could say that because I love ice cream. But there comes a time where I'm like, I've had enough, right? That, that, that's not that's not me fulfilling that choice to be able to love something no no love is an action it's an action it's it's not an emotion but love whatever it is it is not lust I, I was talking about last week and I, I wrote it down in my notes that listen love is not found in the back I mean a lust is not found in the back seat of a, a love is not found in the back seat of a car love is not seen in darkness Love is not seen in secrecy. Are you listening to me? Love is not seen in the secrecy of a phone. Love is not seen in the secrecy of conversations. Love is not seen in that. Love is not seen in, 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 in number locks on your cell phone so somebody can't see it. No, love is not seen. No, that is lust that is in our life. It's lust that is in our life. And so many times we, we have this world that has a distorted view of what love is. But listen, that's not love, friend. That is lust. It's lust. And listen, it is fun for a season. It is good for a season. But the problem is, is we're piggybacking, piggybacking off on somebody else when the truth be told, that's not the love that God gives you. That is a fantasy that is in your mind. That's a fantasy that is in your mind. And I listen, there's a reason why those kids were taken out tonight. I, I told them I, I tried to shake it. I was going to preach something different to go look for us. But they don't need to be able to be in here. But we're adults in here or you're young adults. You're planning to be able to get married. Listen, it matters that you know what love is and you know what lust is. You know the difference. You understand somebody that loves you and you understand somebody just lusts after you. We need to guard our eyes. Why? Because everything that goes in our eyes, it affects our heart. And so many times we don't understand that until we have a heartbroken wife or a heartbroken family family or a heartbroken child you understand it ruins lives may we protect our marriage this is not a hard subject it should not be a hard subject and matter of fact let me say this and I love you and I love Jesus but if any of this offends you then I, I would question whether or not you have an issue with it because this shouldn't offend us if you love your husband and you love your wife you should say praise God we're preaching on this praise God we're sharing that why because I don't want nobody to lust after my wife I don't want no other man to be able to look her up and down and be able to wonder what in the world's going on behind closed door. I, there's no, it's not his business. And vice versa, there should no woman be curious about another man. But here we are, we just overlook it because as long as it's not on the outside, we just think, well, it ain't seen. No, God says, I see everything on the outside and on the inside. He goes a little bit further. Let me say this to you. I talked about people saying, well, you know, it's not about me. I don't have time to be able to read all the texts, but the Bible says in the book of, uh, the book of uh, uh, Judges, chapter number 16, verse number 1, Samson, he was a strong man. In other words, it don't matter how good or how strong you and I are, don't ever think you're strong enough to outdo sin. Nobody. I don't care if we're a preacher or a teacher. I don't care how long you've been married for 50 years. I mean, it makes no difference. Listen, the devil, I think I said this last week, the devil would love to ruin a marriage for 20 or 30 or 50 years. The devil would love to ruin that. Would love to ruin that. And that's why it's almost like fighting hell by the acre sometimes because it takes work in your marriage. Not only that, but also I went down to 2 Samuel chapter number 11, verse number 2. Say, how simple does it start? Well, the Bible makes it very plain in 2 Samuel chapter number 2 that literally, in 11, verse number 2, it says, It came to pass in evening time that David arose from his bed and he walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he listened to me, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. All he did was look at her. All he did was look at her. And sometimes we think, and I, I said this last week, and, and we've, we've, we've been guilty. We know people's guilty. Well, it don't matter where you eat. It long, long, don't matter where you get your appetite as long as you eat at home. Right? Or, or I've heard this. You know, it, 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 don't matter, it don't matter if you look as long as you don't touch. Now, we understand the principle behind it, but it's almost like we are condoning, condoning us to be able to see him when Jesus says, no, friend, that's not the case. We're living like a Pharisee if we say that. So in other words, just because it's good on the outside, it don't matter what's in our heart, Jesus says, no, if you're going to live for me and it's going to be right, 
Friend, you're not even going to look. You're not going to touch. You're not going to lust. You're not going to sit around. And I don't care if it's a two-second rule, three-second rule, five-second rule, or ten-second rule, however long your rule may be. No, friend, you understand your temptation. There's some people that can watch movies and never be worried about nothing. There's some people that go to the mall and, and never be worried about nothing. There's some people uh, that can have a cell phone and you don't have to worry about them doing whatever. Computers don't have to worry about them doing whatever. There's some people that can have Facebook Messenger and never have an issue. But there's some people you know. You know you better than anybody else knows you. We need to know ourselves. We need to be humble. Be transparent. And by the way, spouse, if your spouse comes to you and says, I'm weak in this area, please listen to me. Don't be mad at them. Don't judge them. Love them and thank them for being honest with you. Love them and say, thank you so much for telling me. And, and I know your mind's going to spin, but don't you, let, don't you let the devil get what God's tried to do. You understand? I mean, if they're going to open up and say, honey, I don't know how your spouse talks to you, baby, or sweetheart, or don't say butter bean. Amen. I, Tiffany said, you can call me buttercup, but don't call me butter bean. Amen. And, and, uh, but anyway, so whatever you call them, tell them what it is. And watch God do a great work as the two of you become to be as one and you protect your home and you protect your marriage. Let me go a little bit further tonight. You come down to this text and uh, I want to read this to you if I could because it's very important. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter number 9 verse number 30, you talk, we're talking about removing temptation. I didn't get here last week, but the Bible says this, and when Jehu was coming to Jezreel, listen, Jezebel heard of it. And the Bible says this, and she painted her face and, and, tire, and tired her head and looked out of a window. In other words, she made herself, she made herself in, a, in, a, in, a, in a position, she made herself in an appearance that was enticing to him. Now listen, this ain't popular preaching, but if you want to know why I believe in standards, this is why I believe in standards. Because sometimes people don't know why in the world that we say, whether people listen to it or they don't, that it matters how we dress up here, how short it is. It ain't, it ain't because we're more spiritual. It's not because of, of what it is, but it's because we understand that it is an avenue that the devil can use to be able to make somebody lust. And don't get me wrong, but friend, if you get up here, somebody's got a short skirt, and she goes, and forgive me, I love y'all, okay, y'all can talk bad about it, but they go to pray, and, and they don't know what's going on. You can't tell me that, that, that a man that has a problem with that, you wives will say, don't you be looking at that, right? Because you love your husband. And it's not a mean thing. It's not a standard thing. It's not a pharisaical thing. No, no. It's just what honors the Lord. And it's shutting the door on Satan and saying, this is why we've got standards. This is why we teach our young people to have standards. And, and listen, I know I'm barking up the wrong tree right here most of the time. But there's been too many young ladies uh, and that, that I have seen as teenagers. There's too many young men that I've seen as, as teenagers that they begin to get in that 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 maturing stage of their life where they transition, hormones begin to go crazy. The last thing they need is a key to be able to unlock a door that the devil is waiting for them to be able to open up. And so many times it brings division in a husband and wife. It brings division in, in families and a church leader. I mean, and it should not do that. No, we're here for one reason. And that's to be able to honor the Lord. And we want you to be able to know that. But so many times, listen, we see it. There's places, friend, that I'll go and sometimes even at church and, and listen, you can, you can, you you can mark me down and, and be mad at me and that's fine but I just I'm human just like you there's times I'll go preach at places and, and, and you'll see certain people in certain things and, 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 and I hate to say it that way but you don't even you don't even want to look you don't even want to look that way you say are you confess I'm not I'm, I'm, tell, I'm, I'm a human I live in the flesh I, I don't know if y'all noticed this but about five or six weeks ago we we took the, 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 the plants on the outside and we put them on the inside you say why do we do that well I know my wife sings don't get me wrong I understand that but as Miss Brianna she she's now a wife to another man and, and you take Miss Taylor she's wife to another man and we're sitting here we were pushed to the inside they get up sing as a trio and here we are behind them and listen it might be innocent and nothing but it's perception of it do you understand that it's the perception of it and you say well that's just gone too far is there such thing is going too far of trying to be able to honor the home and honor God and honor their ministry? Absolutely not. So we do that because it's not just a respect out of God, but it's also a respect out of one another. That's why we do that. Why? Because we love one another. And mark it down, friend, listen to me. And you think the devil just fights on the outside of the church, friend, he will divide on the inside of the church. 
He goes a little bit further in verse number 30. Y'all stay with me quickly tonight. The Bible says this. He said, if thy right hand offend thee, listen to this, cut it off. You said, boy, he just went to a whole nother extreme. Yeah, he did. You want to know why? Because this is what he's saying. Whatever extreme you need to go to to be able to prevent that lust, do it. He said, if the eye don't work, friend, you know what? I'll be honest. I can put a patch over my eye and I can still walk around. I can still function. I can still work and I can still do everything. But you cut my hand off, that's a whole nother level. He said, I don't care what you got to do, whatever you got to cut off, you cut it off. I, I don't care how close it is, how hard it is, how, how, how difficult it may be, or how much it means to you. It might be a friendship, and, and let me go further, and I'll just preach right here for a minute, okay? It, 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 might, it might be your friends, or your wife's friends, or your husband's friends, and, and, and your spouse don't feel comfortable with it. And you say, well, that's a hard conversation to have with my friends. Well, who do you care more about, your friends or your marriage? I'm not being hateful and being mean. And let me say this. Don't act like this in the church because we need to make sure we get everything right and we take care of things. You understand what I mean by that? But, but there is a way to keep your distance and respect your spouse even if they are good godly people. You don't need to be put in that situation alone. But sometimes we're like, well, that's just, you know, we're worried about it too much. No, friend, I, you, you, you can't do that. Why? Because the, the enemy would love, the enemy would love to destroy that. He would love to. So he talks about guarding your heart, guarding everything away. Let me lead to this. I'll go to things. I want to now give you two things tonight on this. Divorce. Oh, so hard. The Lord now has something to say about divorce. I give these to you quickly tonight. The Bible says in verse number 31, notice what he says. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now that goes back, if you use the turn back and you write this down, Deuteronomy chapter number 24, verses 1 and 2, what it was is there was a letter that was able to be able to be given. There was papers, if you want to say it that way. And what the Pharisees and the scribes says this, as long as you do it legally, there's a formality, it's okay. That's what they were saying. So in other words, kind of like today, 2021, as long as you do it the right way, you go down to the courthouse and you get the papers and you're completely legally divorced. Can't nobody come against you. They can't get you for alienation of affection. Well, they're divorced. Jesus says, no, wait a minute. I was there whenever you made the vow. I was there when you made the vow. When you said for better or worse, whether it's better or worse now, everybody else might think it's okay to be able to tap out. But to understand divorce, you must understand marriage. Marriage was never intended to, to ever be in a divorce. It never did. No matter of fact, when you go back and you study out the scripture, the Lord allowed, he gave an allowance for this to be able to happen because of the situation. But it was never created that way. And here's why, because there was so much that was going on, whether it would be uh, any kind of adultery, any kind of abuse, it was an allowance that was there but that was Moses that was not God when God created when he instituted the marriage it was for better for worse till death do us part when we done the ring it was symbol symbolic of forever for a reason I mean this is not just a beautiful ceremony no this is this is a marriage that's made in heaven so when we look at this, there's a misinterpretation of the, of the precept. In other words, they, they literally said, well, it, as long as you do it formally, that's all that matters. And Jesus says, no, it's not about being formal. No, friend, you're talking about you made a vow before God and one another that it would be forever. So I wonder, how many of us tap out so quickly? How many of us already lay everything out and we begin to, to think about these things and we begin to move forward and we say, well, you know, uh, everybody understands so-and-so made it, they made it, I can make it too. The Bible speaks of this in Matthew chapter number nine, uh, 19. Listen to this very quickly, if you will. The Bible says this, the Bible says in verse number seven, they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? This is what Jesus said. That was Moses who said it. That wasn't Jesus who said it. That was Moses who said it. Now listen, and I know today's age, there's a lot of divorced people. I understand all that. But I also understand too, there's a lot of you that uh, somebody had cheated on you. Somebody beat you. Somebody had, had put you in a place where you couldn't change them. And what the Lord is saying is if somebody's unfaithful and they do this, he's, he's never intended for marriage to be that way. You understand that? So he don't ever condone that. That's a, that's a decision when you come to, you have to stand before God and, and be able to give an account for that. But the Lord says, no, I intended for marriage to be absolutely forever. In other words, he takes it serious is what Jesus is saying. Let me give you this next verse tonight and then I'll be done. Not only you see the misinterpretation uh, of the uh, precept, but also you see this and I'll be done. You see the main point of divorce. What do you mean by that, Brother Jason? The Bible says in verse number 32, listen to this. 
But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. I'm going to turn back over to uh, Matthew 19, 5 and 6. And said, for this cause shall a man leave uh, shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be as one flesh. Wherefore, there are no more twain, but one flesh. Uh, what therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. So what the Lord is saying is two things. Number one, he's talking about the, the, the sanctity of marriage. And what I mean by that is this, is it's to be holy. Our marriage is to be holy, it's to be whole, it's to be all together, it's to, it's to be honoring to the Lord. In other words, this is how God intended for the marriage to be. Not only that, but also you need to understand this, that when he says this, that he also takes infidelity, he takes uh, immoral actions, he takes it very serious. And, and I'll, I'll, close, I'll close here tonight, but listen to me, what I'm trying to say to you is very simple. That God puts a big price, a big price on our marriage. There's a huge deal about our marriage. And so many times people are thinking they can just jump out and go do something different. And at the end of the day, listen, we are supposed to be a reflection of Christ in the church. Christ ain't never beat us. Christ ain't never cheat on us. He has loved me unconditional. Matter of fact, when I was unlovable. I think sometimes when, when marriage gets hard, it's like all of a sudden people think, well, it was supposed to be easy. Friend, it ain't supposed to be easy. It's a job. You have to work at it. You have to choose. Amen. Maybe y'all got great. I, I got one or two shaking their head and saying amen. I'll say, well, maybe I just got a bad marriage. Amen. And I'm just kidding. Okay. But it is. It's work. It's work. But the Lord said, just because you think that's okay. And by the way, the world has perverted marriage. I mean, not only have they, have they ruined marriage and said, well, you know what, you can get out and they should, and by the way, by the way, by the way, just because you don't like something don't give you grounds to divorce somebody. Not, a, I mean, the Lord, he's not okay with that. I mean, just because you wait a month for separation to be legally divorced and it, it's done by the law, that, that don't mean it's okay in heaven. You, you understand what, you understand what I mean by this? So the Lord is teaching us that it matters who we marry. And, and can I say this? Don't rush marriage. Don't rush into a marriage. I, I don't, don't, don't dive into something because somebody looks good or they got a lot of money or, 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 or whatever it may be. Don't, don't do that. Take your time. Why? Because I'm telling you, and you've seen it and I've seen it. It caused a lot of heartbreak. When people separate, because sometimes people rush into it and they like the idea of marriage. Marriage is not an idea. Marriage is what, what God orchestrated and God ordained. And this world, as they continue to be able to pervert and, 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 and mess up marriage, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not even, I mean, it's like, you know, you just follow the guidelines and you can move on. Friend, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, mar marriage has gone as far now. It's not just about you don't even have to stay together. Now, now they, they've perverted it so much between man and man, man, man and man and woman and woman. And, and I'm just saying that that's not a marriage. There was a man the other day. He made this comment. He said, you know, he said, I'll be honest with you. He said, you're, you're talking about fornication. You know what he said? He said, Adam and Eve wasn't married only because he didn't see a marriage. And that, that immediately, now listen to me, that should tell us, well, I'm talking to somebody who don't even know the Bible. I mean, because at the end of the day, he said it's not good for a man to be alone. So he created a woman for him to have a wife. They were married. They were put together. And then, you know, and he went on to be able to say other stuff. But the problem is, is a lot of the reason why this world, why they are misunderstood about marriage and divorce is because they're getting their information from the world. They need to get their information from Christians or the Bible and understand it's not what the world says and what the government says. It's what God says. It's what God says. So I'll say this in closing tonight, when she comes to the piano, I want to ask you, listen to me. You think it's a hard thing to talk about. Sometimes it's a hard, time, hard thing to preach. But I say it again. And listen to me, what I'm about to tell you humbly. 
I know you as well interact with these situations. But it's not just what we see in black and white. I see the kids when they come and they're broken. I see them when I'm at junior camp and teen camp and I see them sitting over on that pew and they're crying because they got a mom and dad that's separated. I see them when they're heartbroken because they got to go spend this Christmas with dad and this, Chris, this Thanksgiving with mom. Do you understand? And it starts with lust. So what I'm asking you tonight is this. I'm asking you just humble yourself and understand or be reminded one more time the importance of boundaries in your marriage. And let's teach the next generation the importance of not only getting married, but staying married. And for you ladies, when another lady comes to you, teach her how to pray for her husband. Pray for him. Men, when another man comes to you, say, brother, I'm not trying to cut you off. But let's pray for her. I mean, I've, I'm seeing it split the seams. I'm seeing it split ministries. I'm seeing it break kids' hearts. You say, how can I do my part? Reevaluate yourself and say, am I guilty of adultery? Now, whatever you do, don't go home if you're married tonight. And say, honey, I want to tell you, I'm guilty of adultery. All right, that's a loaded statement. Can I get an amen somewhere right there? That's a, that's a loaded statement. <laughs> you buy her like a cheesecake and put a little candle on. I mean, I, I don't know how you're going to have that conversation. But listen, and, and let me say this, and I'll, I'll hush. If we, have a, if we have a regular devotion together, those topics are usually easy to address because a family that has a family altar knows how to repent in front of each other. See, it all flows together. Our Father, I love you. And I do pray. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in. And I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, then I want you to know that the word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that would be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust Him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take Him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today, and maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much, and we are definitely going to be praying for you in this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved, and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way, and there's something heavy on your heart, Again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much and may God bless you.